Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Megan Humphrey, and I am the executive director of HANDS, and I want to welcome everybody to um, another in our HANDS in the Dirt video series that we're doing. Um, and so Charlie Nardozzi, the famous Charlie Nardozzi, is going to be doing a chat about the garden sites and some of the issues and wonderful things happening in gardens right now. And we also do videos called Hands in the Kitchen. We've gone online with all of these this summer because of COVID. Um, and so all of those will also be available. And so the mission of Hands is to get food to folks in need, um, people who are 50 and over. So we do Hands in the Kitchen, Hands in the Dirt, and um, we have started a Support Buddies program as well. So we're trying to get food delivered and meals delivered to folks that are at home, especially these days. So, um, and then we also do a big holiday dinner and we deliver meals and gift bags all over the county on Christmas day, of which many of you have been involved. So thank you for that. Um, so today is happening thanks to Charlie and AARP Vermont and Hannaford. Um, AARP and Hannaford have supplied some of the funding for these. So we're really lucky that we're able to bring these to people's living rooms right now. So if you need to head out or would like to find the videos in some other way, um, we will have them on our website at handsvt.org. And they'll also be available on channel 17 for folks that don't have internet connection and on their website and that's cctv.org. And we will pass those along as well. I'll put those in the chat box. So that's it. And uh, once again, I wore my Peapod earrings. <laughs> local artist Marie Davis in honor of all the gardening that we're doing and um, all the harvesting we're doing right now, which is, there's a lot of that. So thanks so much, Charlie. We really appreciate it and take it away. All right. Thank you, Megan. Um, it's great. It's a great program and I'm really happy to be involved in it. Uh, so as Megan was saying, uh, we're going to talk about late summer gardening, everything from harvesting to planting to um, getting ready to wrap things up. I'm not quite ready to wrap up our gardens yet. So we may do another one of these in September to talk about uh, putting the gardens to bed. Um, and it's going to be a, a digital presentation that I'll be doing. And like I said, at the end, we can answer a few questions. So uh, without further ado, let me share my screen. Let's see. All right, so fall in the vegetable garden. You know, today really reminds us of fall, if you're watching this live with us. Uh, it's much cooler, the wind is blowing, and kind of makes you think that, oh yeah, summer is kind of going on the, the waning side of things, and fall is gonna be coming. So there's a lot of things to do in the, in the garden, and especially harvesting, as Megan mentioned. A lot of produce coming in, you're processing it, you're canning, you're freezing, you're giving it away, um, don donating it to the local food shelf, all those great things. Uh, are good things to do in the garden. But there's also some question people ha often have, and especially this time of year when we're thinking about those warm season crops, like melons and watermelons, um, tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. Um, some of them are pretty s simple as far as when to harvest, you know, when a tomato is red, yeah, you, you pick it, <laughs> it's time to eat it. But others like melons can be a little more problematic. So I wanted to go through a little bit about uh, what to do with some of the crops you have out there now, how to harvest them and how to maximize that harvest. So with cantaloupes um, or any of those types of melons, the best thing to do when you're trying to harvest them and decide when should I harvest my melons is to take a look at the skin color. It'll go from this green color to more of a tannish color. And if it has netting on it, depending on the kind of melon you're growing, um, you may also see that netting kind of getting more pronounced. But the best thing to do is to simply go out into the garden when you see it looking like that color change, lift it up the melon and tug it gently. Not rip it out, but just give it a gentle tug. If it slips right off the vine, then it's ripe. And you can double check yourself by simply bringing the melon up to your nose and sniffing. <sighs> You'll smell cantaloupe right there. Now, watermelons are a little more problematic. I know that some people have had great success with watermelons in our climate. Others have struggled with them. Watermelons like a lot of heat, obviously, and we've had a lot of heat this year, so it could be a good year for watermelons. Um, but they also need some water, and you need to know when to harvest them. And it's not as simple as the cantaloupes. It's not as simple as a matter of, of picking it up and smelling it or, or tugging it, because that's not going to tell you when a watermelon is ripe. 
there are some old home gardening tips out there where you can thump your watermelon. You can tell when it's a hollow thump, it's ripe. When it's a hard thump, um, it's not ripe. I never perfected that one, so I'm not confident with that. Um, another one some people use is check the, the bottom side or the belly of the watermelon to see if it's turning yellow. That could be an indication that it's ripe inside. But the best thing to do though is to look at the vine of the watermelon close to where the fruit is. So in this uh, photo I have up there, if you look up about, well, if you're looking like one or two o'clock, you'll see a little stem sticking out, little curly cues at the end of it. It's kind of right above the melon fruit. That is called a tendril. And that tendril is there, usually it clings to something, and it's an indicator for you to know melon ripeness. When that tendril turns brown, that means your watermelon is probably ripe. Now, if you're in doubt, I say wait a little bit, especially if you don't have animals or anything that might be disturbing that watermelon, because it's always better to have a watermelon that may be a little bit overripe than one that's underripe. There is nothing worse than really babying a watermelon in your garden and picking it too early to op cut it open and all you see is kind of white or pinkish flesh and really nothing delicious. Um, so be patient with your watermelons, but look for that tendril and wait for it to turn brown before you harvest them. Now winter squash is, is kind of easy in the sense that, well it used to be kind of easy I should say, in the sense that you would know it's ripe when it turns the color of that kind of squash. So a butternut, for example, would turn a tan color. Um, acorn would turn a green color. But that's changed a little bit with all these new varieties out there. For example, acorn squash could be dark green, it could be black, it could be white, depending upon the variety. So the first thing you need to know is what kind of variety am I growing? Is it a variety that will mature to that white color, black color, green color, tan color, red color, whatever it is. Know what the, the bottom line color should be for that variety. Then what you want to do uh, with the winter squash is once they've turned that color, you can simply take your thumb and press it Thumb your, press your thumbnail on the skin. If you can break the skin easily, which you would be able to do with this winter squash, this is a butternut uh, winter squash, then it's not ripe. But if you tried it on these butternut squashes, you'll see that it has a lot of resistance to it. That's a sign that that butternut squash is ripe. You can pick it, always leave a little bit of stem if you can on it. Um, you can cure it and then store it uh, for the winter. Uh, so look for the color change and try that thumb technique to make sure that it's ripe. Now, another thing you can be thinking about doing this time of year is with those warm season crops, like the watermelons and the melons, um, and even the winter squashes, is to be pinching them. And when I'm talking about pinching, I'm talking about pinching the growth point. So you can see there in the bottom right of your screen, you have some flowers, and that's the growth point of that vine. That's this little cantaloupe vine that's growing here. I would cut that back to that one leaf that's already fully open. Just cut it right off. You remove the flowers, remove that growth point. What it's going to do then is going to send more energy into maturing those two little squats, two little melons you see there that are starting to grow. And so anything that's already set and on your vine will be able to mature faster because more energy is going to it than sending out new growth. Now, if this was later in the season, I'd say like mid-September, I would even pick off those two little cantaloupes there because they're never going to make it before the frost comes and, and the growing season gets too short for them to really grow well. But at this point, because we're still in August, I think in most places um, in the state, you can probably just pinch off the growth point, leave some of those little melons there, and any new growth points that come out, pinch those off as well. Um, if you're in the mountains, Northeast Kingdom, places like that where it's colder, you might wanna start pinching off some of those small little melons at the same time. Now, harvesting tomatoes is easy, right? You just look for a tomato that's turning the color that it should be, whether it be a yellow one, a pink one, a red one. These are a bunch from our garden this year um, that we just kind of laid out because they look beautiful. Um, and the nice thing about tomatoes, as all of you probably know, is that even if you get them when they're not quite fully mature, like some of the ones here I picked a little early, uh, they will still ripen either on a patio or a deck or indoors. Um, I've been actually doing more harvesting on the uh, immature side, as long as it's not green, but it shows some color, you can harvest it. And the reason I've been doing that is because we have raccoons. They've been coming out and enjoying our heirloom tomatoes. I don't know, it's the first year it's ever happened. Maybe because it's been so dry, I'm not quite sure. So by harvesting a little bit early, they're not as tempted to go after a fruit that's not fully mature, and we haven't had as much problems with them. So tomatoes are pretty easy to harvest, but 
with tomatoes, you really have to deal with the same thing uh, as you do with the cucurbits, the melons and the squashes, as far as pinching them. So as we're getting towards the end of August here, especially if you have some of those old heirlooms, those big fruited ones that I was just showing you, you wanna pinch the growth point. Pinch not only those suckers, which you should be pinching all along, but where it's growing and the new flowers that are setting. So that you have a plant that looks more like that. So you can see the two ends I've pinched off. There's some nice fruit that have set there. There's probably enough time for those fruit to actually grow big enough and start turning red so that you can enjoy them and then harvest them. But anything that has only just a flower or just a little baby fruit for those bigger varieties, probably not gonna have enough time yet. So now is the time to start pinching those plants. The one exception would be cherry tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes are very prolific. And as you know, uh, they produce a ton of tomatoes very quickly. So if they're still flowering and you're seeing baby little fruits on them, I would leave them for another few weeks or so into September. By the time we get to early mid-September, then you can start pinching those flowers as well to make sure that the fruits that set are gonna mature fast enough and, and turn that color that you need. But for the most part, cherry tomatoes are very fast in, in maturing. Now, another thing to do besides just harvesting is to be planting. And this is a good time of year to plant greens and lettuces. And the reason is they like the cool weather that we're starting to get um, and they can do well with the shorter days and with greens or lettuces uh, you can harvest them even if they're not totally mature so that's a really nice thing to do for lettuce i would recommend if you have the capability of doing this of starting some little baby seedlings either in a window or a, a patio or a balcony or a porch area somewhere where you can get them growing in little cells or little containers kind of like what you did in the spring then transplant them out, like when they're about this size, into the garden. You certainly can plant seeds into the garden, but I think you're gonna get faster germination and less likelihood of insects or other creatures bothering those plants if you can start them as transplants first. It may take a week or two before they get big enough to put in the garden, but that's okay because they'll just jump up and start growing really quickly. I mean, even these little seedlings here, if you're just harvesting baby greens, you could harvest some of the outer leaves of these. So there's a lot of other greens though you can grow beside lettuce. Uh, spinach is an easy one, and that one you should do from seed, um, planted in rows or in blocks in your garden, and that likes the cool weather, it'll germinate fast, um, and it'll continue to grow. And I'll talk about overwintering spinach a little bit um, when we come all the way around here talking about greens. Arugula is a nice one to grow in the fall. If you grew it in the spring, you know it's a real tasty green. If you don't want it to be so biting with the flavor and get kind of hot with its flavor, um, make sure you keep it really well watered and hope for cool temperatures. <laughs> uh, that's probably the best thing I could say because it doesn't like the heat. And when you get temperatures up in the 80s and 90s, that's when it starts really kind of getting that really hot flavor to the leaves. But if you do succession plantings of it, so planting a little bit now, maybe a week or two later, plant a little bit more. You know, arugula in 20, 30 days, you're eating some of those baby greens. So you can do that right into mid-September and still get a nice little crop. You can even plant some of the root crops, like, certainly like radishes, because um, they grow in, in about a month to a, a forming a little ball. Make sure you thin them well so they have enough room to form their little radish. And even if you don't get to getting many radishes, uh, radish roots, the tops are edible too. So you can cut the tops and throw them in a salad or saute them. Uh, they're really tasty. They have a flavor like well, like radishes, that's what they taste like. Uh, so that's a kind of a nice one to think of. And of course, kale. Now, the way we grow kale is that we grow it in the spring and then we let it just kind of grow and grow all summer. And so you end up having a little bit of a kale forest. You know, big plants that are really mature. Uh, and what's nice about those is that they can take the cold temperatures. In fact, they taste better and they have better texture once they've been hit by some cold nights in September. And that's the time that I start uh, eating our kale. Up until now, I haven't touched it. Just kind of let it grow, make sure it keeps the cabbage worms off of it, um, and it's done fine. But I don't really start eating it until probably September, October, and then we just eat it right into the fall, winter. Um, it'll withstand a light frost. Um, it's really a tasty vegetable to have in the garden. Sometimes it even overwinters, depending on the snow cover. So just a, as a little recap, these are the kinds of things that you can be planting now uh, because you can harvest them as baby plants. Even that kale I just showed you is a mature plant. You can sow the seeds and get little baby kales and just harvest them that way. But the arugula, turnip greens is another one. Mescaline mix, for those who are not familiar, that's a mix of lettuces and Asian greens and a lot of different kinds of greens. So it's kind of got a nice flavor to it, a, lot of, a mix of color and textures and tastes. Uh, beet greens is another good one. That, like radishes, you can try to grow those. 
you may or may not get a big beet underneath them. Uh, even a baby beet is nice, but it's nice because you'll get the beet greens. Swiss chard's a great one, the kale I mentioned, and the lettuce. Now there's another crop you can plant this time of year, but not quite yet. Don't get too anxious, because I know you're getting excited. It's garlic. Uh, <laughs> garlic grows really well here. Uh, it's a real easy crop to grow. Uh, you want to plant it, though, when you plant tulips and daffodils. So October is the time to plant garlic. Not yet. You don't want to get it growing too soon. But what you can do is either go through the garlic bulbs that you uh, already harvested this summer and choose the biggest bulbs with the biggest cloves to plant um, or get your stock locally from friends or from garden centers. Then once you have it, the day before you're going to plant your garlic, you want to break all those cloves apart, just like they're doing here, uh, put them in a bowl and just leave them overnight. The reason you're doing that is that basal plate, the bottom of that garlic clove, you wanna, uh, is going to form a scar and that scar is going to help it root a little bit faster. Then you want to go out into your, your garden. Usually a raised bed is uh, normally where I recommend people plant their garlic because the only thing I've ever seen that kills garlic plants um, is cold, wet weather or cold, wet soils in the spring. If you have a raised bed, it's going to drain that water out so it's not going to sit in that cold, wet soil so long. Uh, so add some compost to the bed uh, and plant your little cloves about six inches apart, um, just below the soil line. So you want to bury them, but not too deep. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Remember though, every clove is going to be a garlic. I remember when I first planted garlic, I was very excited about it, having an Italian heritage and eating a lot of garlic as a kid. So I planted 60 or 70 of those little cloves, not really realizing that each clove is going to have six or seven <laughs> Each clove is going to form a bulb with six or seven more cloves in it. So I got 60 or 70 bulbs out of this. The nice thing about garlic is that almost all of them survive. I've rarely had it where the, some of them uh, don't survive. So unlike other plants that may or may not make it, garlic seems pretty reliable. So plant as much as you're going to need because if you have a lot of garlic in the house, um, it quite easily can go by pretty quickly within a couple months or so um, if it's not stored properly. What we do for storage is we put it in the basement, we put it underneath a clay pot. The clay pot holds enough moisture around the garlic bulbs, um, but lets it breathe a little bit. And we've had good success holding it for a good six months or so that way. Then uh, come fall, or you can do it right after you plant it in October. I usually wait till November. You get some hay, some straw, some chopped leaves, just bury the bed. I've used this little contraption I put together with the Velcro straps and uh, some pieces of wood wrapped around it just to kind of hold that organic matter in place during the windy days. Um, but all you're doing is protecting that garlic from freezing and thawing. And so if you do it in November or so, um, that's a, a good time to do it. Not that mice and voles will eat garlic, but they will tunnel around in there if they think it might be a nice home. So that's why I usually wait till more closer to uh, mid to end of November, depending upon the weather. If we get a real cold snap, we don't want the, the ground to freeze. Um, so you want to do it before then. Then you just leave it till next spring. You take off the mulch and then you would harvest it next summer. So let's talk also about some of the vegetables that, as I would call it, you can hold them. Um, so this may have more to do with planning for next year than what you can do this year, but I just want to run through some that are good vegetables for the fall. Leeks are really easy to grow. You pl transplant them when you do the onions in the spring, and then uh, like some of these other crops I mentioned, you just leave it. Uh, just like the kale I was talking about. It'll just continue to grow all summer. We cover ours with a floating row cover because we have a, an insect called the leek moth, uh, which will devastate leeks. So this will block the moth from laying the egg so I don't get the damage. But within a couple weeks or so, the leek moth will be done for the season. So I probably will take the covers off and just let the leeks you know, stretch out a little bit. And you can just harvest those starting almost any time this fall uh, and then harvest them right into the winter. I've literally gone out on a December or January day and harvested frozen leeks, threw them in a soup and they tasted great. Um, so leeks are a good one to think about when you're thinking long season crop. Brussels sprouts are another one. If you're growing Brussels sprouts in your garden, you might want to take a look at them because you should be seeing some of those sprouts at the bottom of the, the big stalk. As it goes up, of course, the sprouts get smaller and smaller. If you're not seeing those sprouts at the bottom, the thing you can do now or very soon is to top the plant. Just cut off the top of the plant. That, just like cutting off those uh, melon vines, is going to send all the energy down to make bigger and more sprouts. Um, so that's a good thing to think about if you're not getting much sprouts. But if you have sprouts forming, don't worry too much about it. As you harvest from the bottom to the top, you can snap off those leaves. 
um, but there's no need to snap all of them off until you get to the point where it's gonna make it easier to harvest. So Brussels sprouts is another one. You plant in the spring, you know, just like with the leeks, and you kind of leave it there until this time of year. And again, like the leeks, I've harvested frozen Brussels sprouts and they tasted fine. The key is not to harvest them, put them in the refrigerator and let them thaw out for a couple of days. Then they start looking a little funky. Carrots, uh, if you have a nice carrot crop and you want to save some into the fall and winter, you can protect them by burying them in a hay or a mulch pile. So get some hay or straw or chopped leaves and put down a foot or two layer right over the carrot bed. It works best if you're growing carrots right in the ground and not on a raised bed. On a raised bed, they get too exposed and I haven't had good success getting our carrots to overwinter on our raised beds. It's just the, the, the cold kind of creeps in, I think, from all different angles and, and it freezes the soil. And once the soil freezes, that carrot, when it does thaw out, is just gonna turn to mush. But it is something uh, to play around with if you have them in the ground and you wanna get them. It's kind of like holding them in a refrigerator outside. So if you have enough mulch, you can go out in December, January, February, move the mulch out, pull carrots out, put it back and you'll be all set. Um, beets are not as good at that, but you can extend the season with your beets if you have a nice beet crop um, come October, November by putting that mulch on that I was talking about. The beets won't make it through the winter, but they will make it at least until November, maybe to Thanksgiving or so. So you can go out, remove that mulch, pull those beets out and really enjoy them. Parsnips though, that's the kind of crop that really is hard to, to beat as far as winter tolerance. Uh, we've had parsnips in our raised beds without protection and they still made it through the winter. We pulled them out in uh, April the next year and they tasted great. The thing about parsnips is if you eat them now, they don't have much flavor to them. If you wait till like October, November, then they have sweetened up because of those cold soil and the cold temperatures. It turns a lot of those carbohydrates into sugars and they're much tastier. And the same would be true if you let them go all the way into March or April. <clears throat> Earlier, I talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, overwintering spinach, and you can do that. So if you sow some spinach now, in about a month or so, if it starts looking more like this in your garden, or maybe a little smaller, um, that's fine. You know, by October or so, you might have some nice spinach, baby spinach leaves, and you can harvest it and enjoy it, or you can leave some of it and cover it over with a floating row cover. Um, now, there are different weights of floating row covers out there. There's a summer weight that's just good for insect pests to keep them off the plants. There's a regular weight, which is good for like around freezing temperatures, you know, plants that you want to make them extend a little bit more. Maybe you throw it over a basil plant or a pepper plant. And then there's the, the winter weight one, and that's the one you really want to use. That's the one we, I'm showing here in our garden. And that one, you can't even see through it. It's really thick. It protects plants down to 25 degrees. So with your spinach crop, I would suggest getting some hoops. It could be wire hoops or PVC pipe hoops, kind of stretching them over the bed and then laying that winter weight row cover over the top of that and securing it with boards or stone. What it'll do is it'll keep a nice warm environment for the spinach in there. Now, eventually it's gonna get cold enough that the ground might even freeze, but the nice thing about spinach is it can take it. Uh, it can take freezing temperatures, and if it's protected a little bit by this uh, row cover, you'll see come spring, like early, early spring, like by um, April or even late March, depending upon our winter, um, you can uncover that and see that the plants are starting to grow, and you get an early spinach crop. It's a real treat. I know some people have had success doing this on raised beds by just throwing like chopped leaves or hay or straw and not using the row covers. That potentially could work well too. The only downside is if it's a really wet kind of winter where it's thawing a lot and there's a lot of moisture in the soil, it could rot out that spinach crop. You can also create cold frames. Here's some old ones that I had in my old house. Um, and these are ones I created, I think for $30. I went to the salvage yard, got some lumber, got some PVC pipes, uh, some white plastic, a few hinges, and, and that was it. And what's nice about cold frames is you can extend the season in the spring by planting early or in the fall by holding plants later. Here's another version I did with window sashes, and these are a bunch of greens I was growing. And you could do this so that uh, you can have greens, again, right up until Thanksgiving time or so, especially if you do the, the winter hardier greens, like the spinach and the arugula, um, just by keeping those sashes closed. Now, you do have to remember with these cold frames, even in September and October on a cool day, if it's sunny out, it can get really hot in there. So you do need to vent them and ventilate them and make sure the air is flowing so you can't actually burn those little baby seedlings as they're coming up. 
And then I just want to say a few words about some fall cleanup and, and how to kind of uh, take, o take the garden and, and kind of clean it up for fall, get it ready for next season. And we can talk more about this next time, but there's one technique that I want to introduce to people to start thinking about, because I know you're probably thinking about cleaning up plants that have gone by, maybe some old bean plants or cucumber plants. If you have vegetable plants in your garden that are not disease ridden or insect ridden, now for a broccoli plant uh, like this one that I chopped up, um, it had some cabbage worms, but I'm not concerned about that. Cabbage worms like powdery mildew is the kind of thing that's always around. It really doesn't matter whether you clean up the plant or not, it's gonna be around. So what I've been doing more and more is what I call chop and drop. And chop and drop is a method using a little hedge trimmer, you can see it there, where I just chop up plants that are in pretty good shape. They're not really disease ridden, not too, too heavily insect ridden, and just leave it right on top of the bed for the winter. Now the reason I'm doing this is, is twofold. One, it's nice to have a cover on that bed. It's always good to have something covering the bed so it doesn't erode from the rains and the snow and the wind um, in the winter. Uh, the second thing though is I'm doing more and more what I call no dig gardening. In fact. My new book will be coming out in December, a little shameless self-promotion, um, The Complete Guide to No-Dig Gardening, and I talk about chop and drop in that book. And the idea is that you don't want to disturb the soil, even in a raised bed, because the soil has a natural structure. There's a lot of living organisms that are in there that are uh, creating a symbiosis, uh, an ecosystem. Um, and by digging it up or digging things in or pulling a lot of things out, like a broccoli roots, as you know, they're pretty extensive. You do a lot of disrupting of the soil when you pull those out of the, the ground. That's disrupting all that natural system. So chop and drop gets around that. You chop it down to the ground, you leave it, and then next spring, you just take some compost, maybe a couple inch layer, you put that over the top of it, and you can just plant, because by then a lot of the leaves have broken down. Now, this is not a for the faint hearted kind of uh, technique, because it does leave some chunky pieces there. You can chop it as fine as you want, it doesn't really matter. Um, it also leaves the roots intact, because they're slowly gonna break down. So you may have to work a little bit around the roots in the spring when you're planting, but in my experience, it's not that hard to do, and in a month or so, those things have broken down enough that your plants have been growing up around it, and you've kind of forgotten all about it. So it's something to consider when you're thinking about making your plan. Put the compost down in the spring. Don't do it in the summer or the fall because the compost simply can blow away. So um, if you do have compost or fresh compost in there, it is good to add some mulch on top. It could be a straw mulch, a wood chip mulch. Here's some hay mulch with our dog Linus uh, trampling around there in the fall. Uh, it's nice to have a cover of mulch over your bed because that again is going to protect it just like the chop and drop technique talks about, that's going to protect it from the wind and erosion and protect those microorganisms that are in there too. You know, it won't freeze as, as solid and as thick and, and keep them alive longer so they'll be ready to go in the spring. Um, so protecting those beds and adding the compost um, in more in the spring is probably a good idea. So hopefully this will give you a few ideas about what to do now in the garden, uh, whether it be dealing with your harvest and when to harvest and how to maximize the harvest, what to plant now, and how to take care of it and get ready for the later in the fall. Uh, let's see, Brussels sprouts plants are huge. They look like cabbages. What's going on? Well, <laughs> um, I think you just have a really healthy garden. That's probably what's going on. Uh, if you have a lot of nitrogen, a lot of uh, compost in that garden, those plants will really start growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And what will happen is you're not going to see a lot of sprouts forming. So I think in that case, you might want to go ahead and just top those plants. Just take the top off, try to get it to send more energy down to those bottom sprouts to get them forming. Um, and that way you kind of guarantee what you have. Okay, we have another question. Um, should you chop and drop for all veggies in a raised bed? Are there some veggies it's not good for? Um, I think the, the biggest one, the biggest uh, veggie I would stay away from probably would be tomatoes. Um, and that's because they always seem to get a lot of diseases um, and a lot of problems to them. So that is one that I actually don't chop and drop. I will chop it. I still will chop it. I won't take the whole plant off, but I will remove it and compost it somewhere else. Uh, and of course, if you're rotating crops and if you can do that in your raised bed, that will help too because you won't be planting the same crop 
or a family of crops in the same place time and time again so the diseases don't build up. But if you can't do that, um, it's definitely a good idea to take tomatoes out. Um, but for most other things, I have not really had much problem, even like vining things like butternut squash, I was showing you some of those vines. Just kind of chop them all up in, in, in the soil, just leave them there. Um, I throw some hay mulch over them too, just help it kind of decompose. And nature has its own way of kind of breaking things down. I did talk about uh, watermelon. Someone asked about when watermelon is ripe. So again, look at that little tendril. And someone also had a question about raspberries. And so the raspberries, uh, they got a nice crop in the summer, but they're now looking kind of ratty. What's going on? Well, raspberries, after they fruit their second-year-old canes, whether they're ever bearing or they're just regular July bearing raspberries, they're gonna die. So they're in the process of dying. So what you can do this time of year is go through with a hand pruner and prune out those canes that have yellow leaves and look like they're dying. They'll be the ones with the real woody bark that's kind of peeling off. The new canes you get should have more of a light green bark. Those are gonna be a fruit for either this fall, uh, if you have ever bearing varieties, or next summer, if you have the regular varieties. So are there any other questions before I sign off? It doesn't look like it. So thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Again, I'm Charlie Nardozzi, and this is Hands. And we are doing all kinds of educational things around gardening, uh, around the area. Uh, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully I'll be seeing you in the garden. Take care. <music>